Hey everyone, we're back here on the Whirling Circles Internal Martial Arts Podcast. Very good to have you here. We're very excited um, to be back for our third installment of the podcast. For those who uh, heard our first two episodes, um, you're getting a little bit of sense of all the great information um, that we're sharing here. And, and if you're if you're digging it, for sure, drop a, a review on iTunes for us. That's That would help us greatly to get more exposure for the show and for the information that we're sharing. So go to iTunes and drop a review. And if you're watching us on YouTube, um, definitely hit the like button and subscribe to the YouTube channel. So we're putting out the podcast uh, weekly on the YouTube channel, but we're also going to be sharing some archived video, um, which will be some added benefit and resources. So we're working on that. So if you subscribe to the channel, you'll get a little bit of all of that. Um, but as always, we're joined by Frank Allen of the Wudong PCA. Frank, how you doing? I'm fine. Awesome. Good how to see you. How you doing, Sean? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um, I watched that. I don't know if you get to see it, but you probably heard about it. I watched that uh, uh, that fight this weekend with Tyson. Tyson and yeah, uh, Roy Jones I Jr. Read, you heard about that? I read about it. It was yeah. like, it sounds like it was a decent fight, but like usual, it was wacky judging. Um, Vinny Pazienza, who's fought Roy Jones and is apparently is friends with him, scored it heavily for Jones, and he's the only person in the entire world that saw it that way. Exactly. Yeah. And then they had somebody who scored it as a draw, and then Christy Martin, the great woman fighter, had Tyson way, way ahead, which is what most people saw. But then they had to wonder if maybe they were told it was supposed to come out a draw. Right, because oh. it's the exhibition, and it's kind of for ma- raising money and stuff like that. But, I, I mean, I thought I, I saw it, and I thought they both looked pretty awesome, um, considering, you know, Tyson, 15-year layoff, uh, Jones, shorter layoff. has only been like three or four years since he's fought, but you can tell that he was not as in fighting shape, I would say. Um, he's just such such an amazing fighter that he was able to kind of whip it into into shape enough for the fight. But uh, it looked, I mean, they looked, you know, they were exhausted and winded. But you talk about it all the time. Power is the last to go, and Tyson was looking strong, man. Yeah, most people expected a knockout. Yeah, I mean, um, he he was going for it too. He was going for some heavy shots. Oh yeah. Like I said, the last skill of fighting skill to go is power. Yeah. That's why I expected Jones to get overwhelmed because he was always a speed, finesse, tricky guy. He wasn't even a guy that knew regular boxing technique. He did it all on raw athletic ability, mm. which he had lots and lots. But that usually fades in your late 30s, and he's 51 now. So, yeah. But apparently still got some of it left. Yeah, yeah, he was looking pretty good. He he got he got a, a couple tags, but you could tell after the fight. I mean, they did the post fight interviews, and Roy Jones was looking hurt. He looked like he might have had a broken rib or something. He was looking hurt, <laughs> and Tyson even told him like, "Hey, you know, I know I hit you with a really good one, so I respect that you were able to keep going." You know. Yeah, Tyson in his heyday was a monster. I saw a couple of his early fights before he ever won a title, uh, live in the Garden. Uh, they didn't go too long, but they were very much amazing and fun. Yeah, this is probably his longest fight ever, <laughs> this A-round fight. But, yeah, so I, we definitely should do, uh, in a future episode, we should do some uh, more boxing talk for sure. I'm sure we will, and definitely uh, talk about Tyson and all that history because I know you know a lot about that. But uh, we're in the midst of doing this um, kind of introductory three-part series on the uh, – the three core internal martial arts. Um, last episode, we were able to talk about Bagua Zhang and, um, you know, go over the history and, 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 and how it looks and, you know, what people can expect when they're training in that system. Um, and we're going to continue that conversation today. We're going to be talking about um, Tai Chi. And then in our following episode next week, we're going to be going over Shingi. Um, so let's get, let's get straight into it. What's your... How would you describe um, Tai Chi as you know it and, and how you think it is, has developed in history and how most people in the U.S. and in the West understand Tai Chi? 
Well, Taiji Chuan got famous because Yang Lu Chan and his sons were the martial arts trainers of the Imperial Guard of the Forbidden City. And it's kind of almost sad that it's no, noted primarily as a health art and almost erroneously as a meditation art. It is a martial art. It began as a martial art. Um, if you ask the Yang family people that are around now, they'll tell you it has no meditative content. We can get into <laughs> that later. But uh, And it really, Tai Chi is sort of this incestuous family thing. The, in China, they rep, they're represented by the five family styles, which are Chen, Yang, Wu, Wu. And because people don't get the tonal difference, Wu is usually called Wu Hao and Wu and Sun. And it begins with, as far as I'm concerned, and the view of the people in Beijing, with Yang Lu Chan being a bond servant to the Chen family. Parents were really poor, couldn't afford to feed him, so they kind of sold him on a 30-year bond to the Chens, mm. which a lot of people don't like admitting that the founder of their style was basically a rent-a-slave, but yep. that's kind of that's where it was at in 30 years. And he was really diligent and respectful. And whatnot, so they let him learn their family martial art, mm -hmm. which was at that point was Chen family boxing or Chen family fist. And he learned that before he left. When his 30 years were up, when he was 40 years old, he left, he went back to Yungnan village where he was from. There's of course nobody there for him. And he stays in the pharmacy that was run by the Chen family. And the Chen family rented the space from this family, the Wu family, mm. who the youngest son was Wu Yuxing, who was into martial arts. So he started training with Yang Luchan. And Yang Luchan at that point started adapting into his own style. It was more continuous movement. There was more of a soft element. There was everything that we know as Taiji Chuan today. He started to develop. And the early style still floating around, known as Kuang Ping Tai Chi, because Yunnan Village was in Kuang Ping Prefecture. And at a certain point, Wu Yuxing goes, well, I'm going to take you to the capital and introduce you to my brother who's a minister there. So they go to Beijing, he introduces him to his brother, and they hang out for a month or so. And while he's there, Yang Luchan gets in a number of spear duels and gets immediately famous for the fact that he won them all and he didn't kill anyone, which with a spear is pretty tricky to right. win spear duels and not kill the guy. So he got famous for that, did some demos, and got hired to be the teacher of the Imperial Guard in the Forbidden City. Wu Yuxing goes home and is like, <laughs> just screwed myself out of a teacher. And <laughs> says, well, he studied with the Chen family. Maybe I get something from them. And he heads for Chen village, and he gets about halfway there, and he's in this village. He's staying at night. And the, the hotel or, you know, tavern owner or whatever, way station, because, you know, you don't need to go to, to Chen Village. We've got our own Chen master here. This young guy has developed his own thing. You should check him out. And he does. And it turns out that Chen Qingping had moved there and he had just developed the cannon fist fast form of Chen style. And Wu Yuxing stays and studies with him till he's kind of got that down. Then he goes home and starts mixing his Yang style large frame with his Chen style small frame and creates his own style, Wu style. And one of his top students was a guy named Hao, which is why in the West we call it Wu Hao, because it's hard to separate the tones of the two Wu's. Then, of course, Yang Lu Chan hears that his student has developed this new pretty nifty thing. So he sends his best student, who's his oldest son, Yang Ban Ho, back to Yungnan village to study with Wu Yuxing. Studies, picks up the style, comes back and creates the Yang style fighting fast form, mm -hmm. working with what he learned from, you know, Uncle Wu. And <clears throat> in the teaching of the Imperial Guard, they had three really top students, a guy named 
Young Chung, um, a guy named, I think, Liang, but I forget exactly, and Trenyo. And the first guy developed the harder aspects of Tai Chi, which, of course, isn't really it, but that's what he was into, the Pung energy. And the second guy got more of the soft energy, the give before force part. And Trenyo was the guy that got everything and could shift from hard to soft, mm. from Pung to Lu, and was considered the best of the palace guards. By the way, a little little side thing, the, the guy that got the Yang energy, I think he was Wang Chun, at one point decided he was really good. So he marched off to the Yin Fu Bagua school and challenged for the only recorded match between major internal martial artists. The only time there's definitely a historical, there are legends, but the only historical match between major internal martial artists. And he walks in and challenges Yin Fu, and Yin Fu goes, well, I'm going to fight you right away. you got to fight my guy, Ma Gui, Woodma, who we talked about last week. Right. And uh, Ma Gui comes out, and they line up, and they square off, and the Taiji guy attacks. And bingo, he's blown right through the open door out of the courtyard. <laughs> Picks himself up, brushes himself off, walks back in, and says, okay, let's do this again. And I goes, okay, but, you know, he goes and he closes the door and bolts it. And <clears throat> Wang attacks him again and ends up in the same place. But this time he's been blown through a bolted door, breaking the bolt, breaking the door. <laughs> and it takes him a lot longer to get up. And when he does, he goes home. Um, <laughs> what year was that around? Um, who knows? Would have been or just in general. The... What years are this? Is this happening? This kind of stuff. Uh, mid to late 1800s. Because mm -hmm. people always it would have been you know, somewhere in there. Yeah, there's always this. You know, I, I guess it ties into the mythology where there's always, you know, like these these martial arts are thousands of years old and stuff like that, and came from yeah, yeah, we'll, mystic we'll, sages we'll, on a mountain. All right, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, and then Chuenyo, when he retires from the palace, creates his own style which particularly is trademarked with the oxplow stance. The Yang family uses an upright forward stance, and the Wu family uses a inclined forward, like an ox pulling at the plow forward mm -hmm, stance. That mm -hmm. becomes the trademark of his style. Mm -hmm. And it becomes fairly well known. He has a student, Wang Mo Jai, who's a Beijing businessman, who keeps the style in Beijing and keeps it as close as you can possibly do to the teacher's original style. And then his son, Wu Jin Chuen, moved to Shanghai, changed the style a little bit, created his own form, only a little different, and got really famous, the most famous of the bunch. And uh, when he died, passed it on to his daughter, Wu Yanhua, and his son-in-law, Ma Yu Liang. And then their Sons and grandsons, Wu Gong Yi moved to Hong Kong, modified the form again, made some major changes. Generally, the Shanghai and, and Beijing people don't think too much of the Hong Kong version. <laughs> but on the other hand, in the 70s, 80s, when all the Hong Kong Southern Shaolin guys, the Hung Gar, the Choi Lei Fut, the Wing Chun guys were coming and they did their style plus Tai Chi, the plus Tai Chi was always the Hong Kong Wu style. Mm. So there's quite a bit of that floating around also. And plus Wu Gong Yi got semi-famous for the fact that in 1953 or 54, there was stuff all over the newspapers in Hong Kong about how nobody would seen anybody fight with Tai Chi in decades and decades. They should quit calling themselves a martial art and admit they're an exercise for old people. And the Tai Chi community of Hong Kong wasn't too happy with this, and they proceeded to tell Wu Gong Yi that he was the ranking Tai Chi guy, so he had to defend that. And he was in his early 50s then. Mm. So the newspapers, who of course were promoting it all anyway, you know, selling the news, set up this match between him and this guy in his 30s, 
who does white crane gung fu, Western boxing, and was primarily a local basketball star. That was his claim to fame. But he did white crane and uh, Western boxing. And they took it to Macau, so they could be big betting. And they had this match, which is on film. And it is a very sloppy affair. It's really sloppy. But at the end of the, I think at the end of the second round, maybe at the end of the first round, but somewhere in there, the Tai Chi guy manages to land a sloppy punch on the white crane guy's nose and smash it wide open. And it's bleeding like crazy. And they got the white crane guy in the corner and they're going, well, we don't want to let you come out. We're, you're bleeding so much, you're afraid you're going to bleed to death. It's like, no, I'm fine. I can fight. I can fight. And they're like, damn. We don't want him to fight and get seriously hurt. That would screw up everything. But if we stop it when he's yelling he can fight, the betters are going to go nuts. And it was all about the betting. And so they go to Wu Gung Yi and say, look, would you agree to call this a draw? He's like, yeah, yeah, I don't care. I've shown that, you know, old Tai Chi guys can still fight some. So the, the match went down as a draw. And it was kind of a famous match until the film came out <laughs> about... 20, 30 years ago, and the film started getting separated around, and people were like, what? I've seen better fights with two drunks in a local bar. <laughs> but <laughs> but Wu Gong Yi got famous for that. Mm. And uh, so then you had Chen style, Wu style, Wu style. And then you had Hao, who I was talking about, was basically a, a farm-type guy from Yunnan Village. And he met some of the Yang family, and at one point he went to Beijing to hook up with one of them. I was sure who, but probably Yang Xiaohu, who is famous for being not really too together. In fact, he eventually <laughs> committed suicide. Uh -huh. But uh, and so when Hao got there, the young guy had disappeared, and he's in the city, and he spends all his money, and he gets lost, and he gets sick, and he's living in a flea bag hotel, and he's ill in this horrible hotel. And Sun Lu Dang, who was one of the most famous martial artists in China at the town, in China at the time was a famous Xing Yi and, and Bagua master. And he hears about this, so he goes and gets Hao, brings him back to his house, hires the best doctor, nurses him back to health. And when he's done, and Hao is better, Hao's like, oh, I don't know how to thank you enough, but I don't have anything to give you. All I can do is give you my art. Let me teach you my art. And son's like, yeah, okay. You know, he's in his 50s. He's been doing martial arts his entire life, and he is one of the recognized best Xingyi Bagua masters in China. Mm -hmm. So he absorbs the style pretty quickly, and then Hao goes back to his village, and Sun's thinking about, well, hmm, could be interesting. I could adapt this with some of my moves. And so he takes what he learns from Hao and adapts it with some of his Xingyi Bagua stuff and creates Sun style mm -hmm. Tai Chi. And therefore, those are the five families of Tai Chi, Chen, Yang, Wu Hao, Wu, and Sun. Um, but then, because the people in Beijing like to point out that Tai Chi Chuan really started with the Yang family. That they're the ones that took another art and made it soft and made it continuous and worked on the absorption stuff and worked on the internal power and created everything that we consider Tai Chi Chuan today. And they also, and here's where it gets, it's hard to say they didn't create Tai Chi Chuan. They invented the name. Nothing was ever called Tai Chi mm -hmm. Chuan before the Yang family. Right. Before the Yang family, there was Chen family boxing or Chen family fist or Chen family cannon fist. But it's after the Yang family made Taiji Chuan famous that suddenly they became Chen style Taiji Chuan. And so the people in Beijing are all about, you know, it started with the Yang family. And of course, so is the Yang family. It's all about it started with the Yang family. And then, of course, the two origin stories are that it started in Chen village or the story that it started on Wudang Mountain with John <laughs> San Feng. And the whole thing, I think I may have mentioned last week, but I'm not sure, that one of the differences between America and China, the West and China, there have always been a lot of complete opposites. Like we wear black for funerals, they wear white for funerals, stuff like right. that. And with the same way our salesmen, for a long time, 
have had to deal with the public wanting everything new and improved. So they have to figure out how to take the same old crap and convince you it's new and improved. Well, in China, they wanted everything old and tested. Right. So if you invented anything, he had to come up with a reason it was old and tested. And why Deng Hai Chuan claimed that he learned the whole thing from the Taoist in the mountains when he really just learned the metaphysical health art and then created the martial art himself, but he couldn't say that. Well, the Yang family can't say that they invented Tai Chi Chuan because it's got to be old and tested. So they go to a guy who is actually a very famous Taoist. One of the two guys at the complete reality school of Taoism, which covers most of North China and most of the other sects under it, was one of the, the founding teachers that they, they rely on. And that was John Sun Feng. And in fact, most of the internal alchemy is based on this 100-character tablet of Lu Dung Bin and the commentaries of John Sun Feng. And John Sun Feng was a very famous Taoist who, like, there were legends of him living for 300 years. Of He was hmm. from the 900s. He was seen up until the 1200s. And very well known. And so the Yang family comes up with this story of John San Feng watching a snake fight a bird outside of his cave when he's meditating. And the bird attacks and the snake moves to the side. The bird attacks and the snake moves to the side. And the bird attacks and the snake takes out his eye. <laughs> and the bird flies away. And I love it because it's actually the snake's the winner. <laughs> who, would, nice. who would have guessed? But, uh, and then from the movements of the snake... He creates this marvelous martial art, which is all about getting out of the way and coming back. Give before force, come back, or there is no force against you. Now, as far as history goes, John San Feng didn't do any martial arts ever. He noted nothing <laughs> mentions him in martial arts until the Yang family comes up with it. But he makes a great ancient patriarch with an ancient patriarch story. Right. And the Taoists were always practical, always practical, like part of the. Taoists and Buddhists against each other in China had to do with the, the Buddhists are always going, well, you guys sell your stuff. You, know, you needed a Taoist ritualist before you did anything, a wedding, a funeral, a gathering to celebrate anything. You need a Taoist ritualist and they charge for it and they charge for their healing and they charge to teach their martial arts. So the Buddhists are always, you guys are just businessmen. You claim you're <laughs> spiritual and you're just businessmen. And because the Taoists were like, well, you guys give your stuff away, but then you run around these bowls and beg for a living. You guys are just beggars. Better to be a businessman than a beggar. <laughs> so the Taoists always had the, the more practical side of stuff. Yeah. So as near as I can tell, when the word gets back to Wudang Mountain, which John San Feng was famous for having his hermitage on Wudang Mountain, instead of going, that's not true, like, hmm, that's a pretty good idea. You know, we could we could work with this. <laughs> and all of a sudden there's Wu Dang Shan Taiji Chuen with lineages back to the twelve hundreds. Except nobody ever saw it till the late eighteen hundreds after the Yang family had made Tai Chi and made it famous again. You know, and there's still to this day there are people and I hope this doesn't get me in trouble with my teacher and the people that I know on Wu Dang Mountain because we study there, but the reality is nobody saw this style until after the Yang family had right. done their Tai Chi thing and claimed John San Feng as their ancient patriarch. So most so people who know, figure that... Who either, knows, right? But the history books Most people figure either it came from Chen, Chen Village, which is the official Chinese government version, by the way, yeah. or that it came from um, John San Feng on Wudang Mountain, which is that story. And that, of course, also with the, the Tai Chi classics... It was Wu Yu Xing who came up with the Taiji classics. And of course, he was the educated guy in the whole thing. Him and, and Sun Lu Dong were the highly educated guys. Mm. And I think it's fairly obvious that Wu Yu Xing wrote the Taiji classics. But he couldn't say that. So they come up with a story of his older brother, found a book in the salt shop. And the book was written by the guy who went by Chen Village and taught them their internals to their style. It's like, it's at all you couldn't invent anything. Yes, yes. Well, I got a, I got a couple. So maybe, well, you talked about um, 
large frames, small frames. What what, is, what exactly that means? And and you know what are like the different. You know, obviously there's different interpretations of form. Maybe full forms that are totally different. But what? How do you think the the different styles uh, differ from one another? Or how are well, they the same too? Primarily, they're a lot the same, except that Chen style is much more explosive and a little bit broken up. And I really see Chen style as a bridge between long fist and Tai Chi. Mm. But of course, now it's Chen family, Tai Chi Chuan. Right. But it's it's different from the others. And Guang Ping Yang style is a little closer to Chen style than the other Yang styles because it was intermediary stage when Yang Luchan was just developing his thing. And Sun style has these little short steps and stuff like use a lot of Xing Yi follow step because he was a Xing Yi master. Mm. And so they have they have their differences. But then, of course, Wu style's trademark is that ox plow stance because it develops a short range power. Wu style has its big moves, you know, obviously in um, single whip and fan through the back, but primarily it's a small frame. Generally, small frame and large frame are like machines that large frame would be like a machine with small gears on the outside that create big movements. I mean, on the inside that create big movements on the outside. Right. And small frame would be the opposite large gears on the inside, which creates smaller movements on the outside. And of course, actually young family has large frame and small frame. It's just most of what is taught is young Chen Fu's large frame, but they do have small frame forms. So the so the the style that can be seen most mostly here in the U.S. and and local parks and stuff like that. Which style was that? Young style. Young style. Young then, style. Absolutely. Um, the first public Tai Chi demonstration was in 1954. Dance mistress Sophia Delzer did a Tai Chi demonstration for the U.N where she had spent time teaching dance in Shanghai and mm -hmm. had actually studied Wu style with Wu and Huan um, Liang, the son-in-law and daughter of, of uh, Chuen Yong. But, uh, and she came back, but she was an interesting old lady. She was still around when I first got here. Mm -hmm. We first heard of her. She had a book we'd kind of looked at. It. It's like, well, okay, what's this? Because we didn't know anything about Wu style. Everybody's doing Yang style. But uh, she was when Bruce Francis came to town and started advertising as the very first person to teach Wu style in America. She was bad shit because she had <laughs> had demonstrated for the UN 30 years earlier. Right. But then we also discovered as a dance mistress, she had studied it as movement. And mm. she was convinced it wasn't a martial art. She would mm. argue with anybody that said it was a martial art. She was convinced it was movement because that's the way she learned it. But, you know, the Chinese teach you what you want to know and, and pay me. Right. But, uh, but, but she was, was the original. And then some people, of course, came in the China. There were probably people in the 1800s in the Chinatown teaching just Chinese, but nobody outside of that knew anything about them. And then in the early 60s, uh, William Chen came to New York, opened up his school. He was the best known student of Master Zheng Min Zheng. And about the same time, um, Guolian Yin, Mongolian, who did actually Guangping, tai, Yang style Tai Chi Chuan, as well as Xing Yi and Bagua and Northern Shaolin, started teaching in San Francisco. And they were a couple of the earliest guys. And then uh, a few years after William got here, his teacher, Cheng Min Cheng, stopped for a short while in uh, San Francisco, managed to get in a hassle with Guo, <laughs> and uh, moved to New York and opened up a school. Because that was funny. I'm not sure why, but Guo decided that probably because Cheng was a gentleman and a painter and a poet and a musician and Guo was one of the old guys that actually had worked as a bodyguard and a cargo guard riding around killing people before he came here. 
and he didn't think much of Cheng Min Cheng. So he went and challenged Cheng Min Cheng, and Cheng Min Cheng wouldn't come out and fight him, but he sent down a paper that said, All right. sign this paper because I'm a doctor, and if we fight, I'm going to touch your vital points and kill you. And you have to sign this paper that says I'm not responsible for doing that. And Guo was like, I'm not signing your paper. He probably didn't even read and write. It's my right. bad. And then when he came to New York, Guo followed him out here and sat in his garden in New York for three days. <laughs> Showed up, you know, he'd go home at night and sleep, but three days sitting in the garden, going come down and fight. And Cheng Min Cheng sends the same paper down. Till so for decades, Guo's people are like, Well, Cheng Min Cheng was afraid to fight, and Cheng's people are like, Well, Guo wouldn't sign the paper. <laughs> So there was that whole thing. And uh, Cheng Min Cheng and William kind of really popularized Yang style in the United States. They taught a lot of people. They taught quite differently, though. When uh, It's interesting. When Cheng Min Cheng was in Taiwan, and he's one of the groups in 1949, went to Taiwan. And when he was in Taiwan, he taught equally. He taught it as a health art to people that needed their health improved. But he also taught it as a fighting art and gave a lot of demonstrations. He's a little guy. He gave a lot of demonstrations how no one could push him, no one could move him, and did a couple of sparring things and whatnot. And then when he came to the United States, it was interesting because one of his other top students went to Malaysia. Hmm. And Chang came to the United States and was appalled at how, I mean, he's hitting New York City in the 60s. Yep. He's appalled at the violence. He's appalled at the aggression. He's appalled at the tension. Everybody's all muscular and tense and whatnot. And he comes to the States and he starts teaching it as a relaxation and health art almost primarily. Hmm. You think to Same counteract time. that? Yes, exactly to counteract that. That's why. And at the same time, William shows up and starts teaching, um, among other things, his Tai Chi principled kickboxing because William was noted as a fighter as a kid in taiwan he did the taiwan and all southeast asian tournaments and placed in a couple of them and they were really rough tournaments and he was noted as the tai chi guy that could fight mm. and this continued, I mean, yes yeah. william cc C. chen in fact when he first got here and was hooking up with priscilla who was his wife who i've seen pictures of her then well, she was <laughs> quite quite the young lady, shall we say. But he took her to the Sun Sing Theater to see the, the Kung Fu movies. And some teenage kid was running up and down the aisles, doing martial arts, yelling and screaming. And William tells him to sit the hell down and be quiet. And all of a sudden, there's this guy in his 40s standing next to William's chair going, that's my son. No one talks to my son that way. I'm the only one that can discipline my son. And William says, well, then you should have taught him some manners. Mm-hmm. And the guy goes, you can't talk to me that way. And William goes, well, of course I can. And the guy starts laying off. His, I'm from such and such a Shaolin school. I studied with so-and-so, yada, yada. And William stands up and goes, well, that's nice. He doesn't give the guy any inkling of who he is. Just, well, that's nice. And the guy attacks William. And William blocks a little bit. And the guy attacks William again and goes flying backwards and lands and buckles his knee badly. <laughs> and the guy obviously had some pretty big cojones because then he limps back in and starts fighting with William some more and William decides, well, the hell with it and starts opening up with his punches. And it goes as legendary, who knows? But the legend is that when the fight was stopped, the guy had broken ribs, cheekbone, jaw, whatever knows. Who knows right, how much right, of that's right. true? But he was definitely busted up. When the only white guy in the theater comes down Wraps his arm around the Shaolin guy and says, look, you showed everybody you're brave. You're not really in shape to fight. Let me walk you outside and get you an ambulance, which he did. And interestingly enough, that one white guy in the theater was karate legend Peter Urban. Mm. So you had this famous thing where William Chen's fighting some Shaolin guy and the fight's broken up by Peter Urban. It's <laughs> one of the great New York City legends. That's awesome. And so, William was yeah, always, yeah. you know, the fighter. Mm. And... Cheng Min Cheng, on the other hand, was brought to New York by some Chinatown association and was <clears throat> teaching in their association headquarters on Canal Street. But they only wanted him to teach their members, much less non-Chinese. And he started teaching everybody, including a bunch of hippies, some hippies that got him high at one point. <laughs> 
They said, uh, little professor, you can't tell us you don't like to get high. We watch you drink a bottle of brandy every day. So try this stuff. And he did. And of course, like a lot of people first smoking, he got apparently kind of paranoid. And I said, oh, oh I, I don't like this smoking. He says, brandy makes my chi go down. This makes my chi come up. And of course, I know that story because one of the hippies that was, oh, and he was letting hippies crash there also. And one of the hippies that was crashing there and got him to smoke was my first Tai Chi teacher, Jimmy O'Mara, who I was talking about last week. Irish Jimmy O'Mara was nice. one of those guys. So then they kicked him out of that, and he opened up his own school, the Sher Jung Academy on Bowery, and was there right up until he died. So, the, I mean, I guess the biggest question I have, and probably a lot of our listeners, is why when people think of Tai Chi, they think of just a hell fart, and why do they think of soft medicine? Like, if I tell my friends that I'm doing Tai Chi, they're like, oh, that sounds peaceful and relaxing. And I'm like, I'm sore as fuck for my Tai Chi class last night. <laughs> so so where, do you, where, where did that all happen? Well, a lot of it came from Chang Min Chang and a lot of the people that branched off of him and some of the other people, because you can get a lot more people studying for health. Mm -hmm. than you yeah. will for for fighting. I mean, I never studied with, with William, but I met him because, like I said, I studied with B.P. Chan, who taught in his school. And I got to hang out and talk to William under some circumstances. And uh, William said to me, you, you know, you make your living off of the health people. Mm. You find your fighting people because you like to teach them and it's fun to teach them and you get somebody to spar with, but you always make your living off the health people. And he said the, the popularity of martial arts comes and goes in waves. Right. But when the popularity of martial arts goes, you still have the people that come and study for the health aspects. So the health aspects got really pushed. And then you got a lot of teachers after that that only knew the health aspects. They never learned the fighting aspects. And Tai Chi is very difficult to fight with because it's completely soft. Give it a force to come back where there is no force against you. It's very intricate. And if you're not internal and soft, the stuff doesn't work. So it's more difficult than almost any other martial art to learn to fight with purely. And in fact, I've never known anybody that could fight with it purely. People like William Chen, his student Cecil Chu, myself, we took the principles of Tai Chi and applied them to whatever the rules of the sport fighting was, the tournament rules, the kickboxing mm -hmm. rules that our fighters were doing. And it worked on the principles of the internal arts and the principles of Tai Chi, but it wasn't exactly Tai Chi technique. And there wasn't that many of us that did that. It got to the point where most of the teachers out there are teaching for health. And unfortunately, many, many of the teachers out there don't even know the martial applications. You asked how this move is used in fighting and either look right. at you blankly or they'll make up some ridiculous thing off the top of their head because they were never actually taught the applications. So someone could, I mean, it sounds like someone could just learn like the forms and get like almost like Qigong benefits from learning the forms and getting, you know, the, the muscles moving in certain ways, maybe learning expansion techniques and all this kind of stuff. But in terms of like fight and martial application, um, never even needing to really go there. So there's that big disconnect. And, and there's probably like famous teachers who are just coming off of that new agey kind of health uh, um, training and, and don't have any martial application in the U.S., right? Um, unfortunately, all over the world. Yeah. That's what it's gotten famous for is for its health. Because it is really, really good for your health. And it is a... Qigong, it's a martial art and the Qigong, yep. all internal martial arts are martial arts and Qigong, but the health aspects of Tai Chi are quite phenomenal and they've done studies on it. And so it's really well known, it's better known as a health art than it is as a martial art. And I would say a vast majority of the people doing it in this day and age do it as a health art. And as I said, as far as meditation goes, one of the biggest falsehoods of the stuff is that you do Tai Chi and you're doing meditation. Mm -hmm. You do Tai Chi, you're doing Tai Chi. Like I said, the Yang family said it has no meditation aspects. But I was lucky enough to be with a teacher that taught us that the thing is the Taoists being practical people looked at human beings and said, well, we only do four things. We lay down, we sit up, we stand up, we move around. That's it. 
So they created lying, sitting, standing, and moving meditation. Mm-hmm, yep. And Tai Chi form become a great vehicle for moving meditation. But that's when you learn a meditation and you learn Tai Chi and you put the meditation inside the Tai Chi, which is not that easy to do. But that's when it's meditation, when you can take a meditation system and put it inside the Tai Chi and do the meditation while you're doing the Tai Chi. Then it becomes moving meditation. And it's not something that any of the classical systems did. It's a relatively new idea, but it's just taking the Taoist concept of moving meditation mm. and realizing that you have a good vehicle for it. Well, there's also, I mean, isn't a lot of people say too that um, the <clears throat> when you think about the three internals, you can think about them in kind of like um, different life phases, Shingi being for younger, kind of higher young kind of life phase, Bagua being more... Uh, of a mix of the two and then Tai Chi being more of a older practice. That's kind of what it's become. Um, I know you've talked uh, about that. You kind of came into it backwards, right? Like, Well, everybody in America that started when it came. Because yeah. what you're talking about is the classical Chinese ideology of how you would study the three of them. Yeah. But the thing is, in the order that they came to the United States, Tai Chi came maybe 20 years before the other two. Mm. Then Bagua came a little before Xing Yi. So almost all of us were doing Tai Chi. Then we discovered some Bagua, and then somebody started teaching Xing Yi. So all of us that started as they showed up <laughs> did it the exact opposite way. And so, and I mean, what is the transfer over from one to the other? Obviously, the internal practices, but you know, you talk about a lot of Bagua and Xing Yi masters. Uh, becoming then masters in Tai Chi and vice versa. Um, how do you think is, you know, it, wh- why can someone uh, absorb some of the other arts and why can, you know, you teach all three, you know, um, in the Wudong PCA. How can someone, you know, so- someone could argue, oh, that's too much. You know, you give me too much content. You know, I'm trying to learn the Tai Chi, tai chi thing and you're teaching me the Bagua thing. Uh, what do you say to that? Well, for a lot of people, it is too much. Yeah. <clears throat> and not that many people do all three. And Tai Chi is vastly the most popular with a lot more people doing it. And like I said, doing all three of them, for starters, if you try to do them while you're still beginning, you'll just get confused. You have to you don't have you have to have all the basic principles of the first one you're doing and the basic ideology of the first one you're doing down before you move into the next one so that you can understand the differences and the similarities. But Bagua and Xing Yi are still relatively rare, even in China. I always remember when the first time before we were studying it at all, with when China first opened up in the seventies, one of the first things they did was we sent our ping pong team to challenge them in ping pong, which is ridiculous because they had it as a major sport, which no one else did. And they were just tremendous, outrageous ping pong players. But we <laughs> sent our ping pong players over to get slaughtered by the Chinese. <laughs> and the ABC world of sports that used to be on Saturday or Sunday afternoons yeah. and whatnot, were covering it. And I remember one of the first things they did, they went to one of the big parks and they showed there must have been 2,000 people doing Tai Chi, synchronize. And then look, here's this rhythmic exercise. And then they said, and there's one little fellow over in the corner that seemed to be doing his own thing. And they flashed to the corner. And of course, typically, Bagua people are weird. There's this one weird little guy in some big oversized shorts and a, a like sports shirt not tucked in and a big build, like, sort of like a baseball cap but with a big bill on it. And he's walking around a tree doing Bagua. One guy, like 2,000 people doing Tai Chi, and one little fellow in the corner seemingly <laughs> doing his own thing. One guy doing Bagua. It's like, <laughs> yep. Well, is that, I was telling you, uh, you know, I train at Tompkins over here in the Lower East Side, and there's Tai Chi all over the place, and I was doing my practice today, and I always start with uh, my Tai Chi form. And so the Tai Chi folks are looking at me, and they kind of like recognize what I'm doing. I'm doing Wu style, so it's a little different um, than what they're doing. But they, they recognize it, and then I break out into the Bagua, and they're like, what's, what's this? 
why is he walking in circles kind of thing. And then you see like one old school cat who recognizes it and kind of gives you the head nod. And then I break out into the Xing Yi and, and no one recognizes that. And now they're like, all right, he's not doing any meditation anymore. Now he's doing some fighting stuff. Um, so it's definitely uh, uh, a little bit more unique when you get to the Bagua and the Xing Yi. But w where do you do you see um, could we be doing a better job in the U.S. on trying to promote Tai Chi as a martial art? And is there anyone doing disservice to that? Well, everybody that's doing it just as a Qigong and doesn't know it as a martial art is kind of doing a disservice, but not as bad as the people that think they can teach it as a martial art and were never really trained how to do it. They're the worst. <laughs> but no, it's a, it's a great health art. And it's, as William said, the health people are many more than the fighting people, and they always will be. And so it's really just fine to let it be a health art. It's difficult to learn as a martial art. When we were talking about the difference between classical martial arts and fight sports and close quarters combat last time, or a couple times ago, um, Taiji is one of the most difficult, and I said it's historical close quarters combat is going to have some moves that work then that don't work now. Right. And Taiji may have more of them than most styles. That's why you take the principles and adapt them to other things. And no, I think it's fine to let it be the way it is. It's just as long as you don't have the people out there that claim it's not a martial art, that don't historically understand it enough to know that it is a martial art that is also a Qigong and can be adapted to a meditation and you don't have people trying to teach it as a martial art that have no idea what they're doing. Mm. So, so maybe, um, I, again, it's always hard with the podcast, but maybe uh, you can help people understand how some expressions of, of Tai Chi in a martial art, um, you know, how, how does it express in a martial art? Do you have some of the more like, you know, um, fundamental kind of Tai Chi positions that people probably know if they're a Tai Chi practitioner? How, how does it apply in, a, apply in a martial way? Well, the positions are kind of templates as to how this stuff works. The whole idea is it's soft. It's give before force and come back where there is no force against you. So number one, that means it's a defensive art. Mm. Purely done, there is no opening offensive. You start fighting moves. Everything is a reaction to balance out and come out on top of what your opponent has done. Your opponent always attacks first. Like they say, he moves first, I finish first. But it's always a reaction to what they're doing. So it's all your basic ward off, roll back, press. Is they're doing something. You ward it off. You roll back and draw it in. You take them off balance. And then you come back and press them and move them away from you. Mm -hmm. And also Tai Chi is always, everything is unbalance them, break their root, and then attack. You should never really attack until you have unbalanced them and broken their root. I said it's difficult to actually do purely, but that's the idea. It's defensive. It's ward them off, get the, get the attack off, break their balance, have them ready to go before you ever apply any real force. Yeah, I mean, this concept of breaking balance could be like a concept that travels over into any other martial combat sport or fighting system. That not every and not not all of them have uh, innately, you know. So having that tai chi to kind of teach you that practice is good. I mean, I already I feel when I do my tai chi w with you, I just feel more rooted than I have with any other um, system I've learned. And I think it's also part of it is slowing down. Like sometimes we speed through techniques in other martial arts because we think that's the right way to do it <laughs> you know we're like racing through it and 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 we kind of overlook where our weaknesses are but when you're going super slow and you have to shift weight and you have to be in the proper position or you're going to topple over it really makes you kind of uh, uh connect to that i think more than a little bit more than other systems well of course in the wudang physical culture association we have what we call the haney calder rule which relates back to a 1960s movie with Raquel Welch, where at the beginning of the movie, she and her husband are attacked by the three grotiest character actors in the world at that point. And they kill her husband and rape her, and then she wants revenge. It's a classic almost Chinese revenge story. 
Right. So except for going to a Kung Fu master, she goes to a pistolero who's Robert Culp. And she gets him to teach her how to be really good with a pistol. But in the first lesson, she pulls it out of the holster real quick and drops it on the ground. And he picks it up and he tells her, slowly and carefully, first slow and correct, then fast. First correct, then fast. And all martial arts have to be learned that way. You should do them slowly and correctly before you speed them up. Tai Chi's trademark is in the form, it never hits the speed up stage. It stays in the slowly and correctly stage, which is why forms only are a Qigong. And it doesn't speed up until you go into the two persons. The push hand starts slowly, but then it speeds up. And then when you get into applications, it speeds up. And some of the styles have fighting forms, like the, the Yang style fast form. It speeds up. But in its basic form, it's that slowly and carefully, first correct, then fast. Tai Chi in its basic form never hits the fast stage. It leaves that for other practices. But everything should be begin that way and then speed up. Yeah, for sure. And and um, there's weapon usage in Tai Chi. Is that something that is from the system's roots or is it? taking some of the forms and applying weapon usage to them. Well, I think I pointed out earlier that Yang Luchan got hired to teach the Imperial Guard because he won a series of spear duels. In general, the empty hand forms in all of this stuff were to develop the basics, and they weren't expected to be used that much. I mean, the Kung Fu movies are all empty hand, but let's face it, the soldiers, the bodyguards, the security guards, the cargo guards, those boys didn't go to work empty handed. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was all about the weapons. But you learn the empty hands to learn the principles and learn the basic movements. And then you learn how to do them with the extension of the weapons. But yeah, the weapons are the base of all of it. Because, like I said, soldiers and the guards did not go to work empty handed. Yeah. And so what, what, what do you, uh, you, you have any weapon uh, forms that you like to teach at the Wudang? Well, we have a lot of weapons forms, but when it comes to, to Tai Chi, there's, of course, the Tai Chi straight sword, which is the most popular Tai Chi weapon in the world. And as you know, Tina teaches that. And because uh, the story is the Wu style straight sword is one of the more complicated forms that I've ever seen. And. As people know, I actually learned it three times and forgot it three times and said the hell with it because <laughs> I'd learn it. I'd get some new Bhagwan Shingi to learn. <laughs> By the time I'd gone through my Bhagwan Shingi, it disappeared. And after doing that three times, I'm like, well, <laughs> maybe I don't need this. I've got Bhagwan sword and Shingi sword and Bhagwan broadsword and deer horn knives and a whole bunch of other stuff. I do a thing called, which you learned from me, called Taiji Whipstick which is a rather rare four-foot stick Tai Chi form. And Tina also does um, Tai Chi Saber. And then we learned in China uh, a little bit of Wu-style spear. But where the other styles tend to have spear forms in Wu-style, they teach the three or four basic fighting techniques. And a little two-person thing you do with the four basic fighting techniques and there's near as we were taught, that's pretty much it. But we learned mm. that while we were in China also. Awesome. So we've done a little bit of Tai Chi stuff, mostly based around that wicked sword form. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I was doing some whipstick the other day in the in the park, and I caught myself in the head. <laughs> I whipped the shit out of my head. <laughs> Got a big bump. I was like, oh, man. Got to practice this one. Um, all right, cool. So you also, uh, you and Tina um, co-authored a book on Tai Chi Chuan with the Wu style focus, which was um, not that many books out about that. Can you talk a little bit about the book and how that came together and and what, what why people should pick it up? There it goes. There it goes Tina, too. <laughs> yep. Uh, like I said, we're working on our Bagua book. When 
my friend Jesse from San Francisco came out, and he was working for North Atlantic Books. And he said, the Bagua book looks great, and we can't wait to get it. But you guys do Northern Wu-style Taiji Chuen. And as far as I know, no one has ever done a book on Northern Wu style in English. So I'd suggest you drop everything and get it out as quickly as possible. So we did. Nice. <laughs> and, and you know, it's, it's, it's a good book. It's got a little bit of history. Um, I was told not to get carried away with the history. Implications being that I had in the Bagua book. But, uh, yeah, it's got, got some history. And uh, it's got Tina's translation of the Taiji classics which is a very good translation and it has the fundamentals. And then it has the Wu style long form. And then it has the Wu style sword form. So it's a relatively complete Northern Wu style book. And if you're interested in Northern Wu style, as far as I know, it's still the only one in English. There you go. Yeah. I didn't realize those translations were all Tina. So that's awesome. Oh, yeah, both the Taiji classics and the Bagua methods in the Bagua book. That's all Tina's translations. That's awesome. And and a couple of years ago, um, Tina also released with you the Tai Chi Club, which people can find on Amazon. And what, yeah, it's what a documentary, you, what, yeah. Tai Chi Club, which is pretty much the story of Tina coming from China to America and discovering... Chinese cultural studies here at the Wudang Physical Culture Association. And then it gets into us a little bit of history and what we do and how we do it and going to China. And, and then it's got the stories of some of our more interesting characters that are in the school. And it's a really nice, nice little documentary, which is available on Amazon Prime, Tai Chi Club. Yeah, definitely. We'll get it in the show notes for sure. And we'll get the book link in the show notes as well. And and as we t discussed in the, the prior episodes, you're all teaching uh, Zoom classes as well. Um, and so you're teaching this Northern Wu form uh, via Zoom. So we're going to have that in the show notes as well. So people, if you're interested in, um, in learning it, maybe you know another Tai Chi form and you practice a different style and you want to get exposed to a new one, um, you have a great opportunity now with the pandemic. Uh, we got uh, these online classes going on. So people can take advantage of that. So so uh, before we close here, um, if people are trying to think about um, their Tai Chi practice and maybe making it um, more complete, do you think that uh, people should be, you know, you said it's fine if people keep it like at a health, like in a health framework. Um, very few people are going to get the martial application. But do you think that it's beneficial with the Tai Chi to um, start bringing more like energetic work into it? Because sometimes it feels like um, it can be a very uh, like a little slow practice and a younger audience sometimes gets a little um, impatient with oh, it. What do you think about that? Well, it should definitely have the energetic component. And also I like, you notice when I'm teaching, mostly Tina's teaching the Tai Chi these days. But you notice I also like to at least show the applications as what I – consider applications as mnemonics. If you have some idea what you're supposed to be doing martially, it actually just helps your structure, gives you a better idea where your hands, feet, arms, and legs go. If you have some idea of what it's supposed to be doing. I'd also like to point out you do Tina's Tai Chi. You've got a pretty direct lineage there. As I said, Trenyo created this style. And then his, his uh, son, Wu Jen Chuen, when the dynasty fell in 1912, decided it was not a great idea to keep their Manchurian names. So he posthumously named his father Wu Trenyo, probably having the old Manchurian warrior spinning in his grave. And, uh, but then, as I said, he taught a, his businessman Wang, Wang Mo Jai in Beijing. And Wang Mo Jai pretty quickly took on a young genius martial artist named Yang Yu Ting who proceeded to teach for the next like 70 years, lived into his 90s. I mean, our favorite statement on Yang Yu Ting was that Yang Yu Ting uh, lived to be in his 90s, taught over 70 years of Tai Chi, and he smoked, but he knew how to nap. 
You know, <laughs> he's a big napper. And he ta- he was the founder of the Northern Wu Style Taiji Trend Association in Beijing. Uh-huh. And one of his top students was Li Bing Su. And Li Bing Su is the guy that Tina and I did the Bai Shu with, and we're formal disciples of Li Bing Su. So you got a pretty direct line when you're doing Wu Style Tai Chi with us. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much, Frank. Another great episode, some some great knowledge. Um, and again, for those who are new to the show, uh, feel free to head over to iTunes, drop that review for us, subscribe on YouTube, all that good stuff. And all the stuff that we've been talking about here in this show, where I'll uh, put some reference links and some links to the book and the documentary in the show notes so that people can access it um, and follow up. And definitely reach out to Frank and Tina if you want to get um, some of that Northern Wu style training. And then next week, we're going to be back uh, finishing out this uh, intro series. And we're going to be talking about Xing Yi, which is probably... Out of the three, I would assume is probably the one that's uh, least known about, right? There's probably the least uh, uh, out there about it. Um, so I'm sure people will be interested in tuning into that one. So that'll be next week. We'll be back uh, next Wednesday with the Shingi episode. Thanks so much, Frank. Thank you. All right. Talk to you soon. Absolutely.